In September 1986, Konami brought classic horrors from cinema to the Famicom Disk System. The result was a tightly knit, expertly crafted, all killer no filler masterpiece of an action platformer. It's Castlevania for the Famicom Disk System and the Nintendo Entertainment System. kids talking about Konami video games from the Nintendo Entertainment System like they were real. Come on! Castlevania was known as Akumajo Doracula, or Devil's Castle Dracula in Japan. It's an action game primarily, with some platforming and jumping as well. You control the character Simon Belmont on a journey through Dracula's castle on a quest to destroy him after he awakes from a 100 year long slumber. Unlike most games that I've covered so far, this game takes place somewhere on Earth, in Transylvania, which is a historical central region of Romania. And according to the manual, it takes place in the year 16. The game is compromised of six main blocks, each block containing three stages, giving the game 18 unique sections. You have to complete each stage in order, which is unlike some later entries in the series. The player starts with three lives, and upon expending all three, the player will have to restart from the beginning of the block they are currently on. If you die with lives remaining, you will continue from the given stage you died on. The first two stages of any given block consist of a series of platforming challenges with a comfy variety of enemies, items, and sub-weapons to try. The most common pickups that you'll find are money bags and hearts. Money bags award the player with points that are tallied along with the player stats at the top of the screen. Hearts, however, serve two purposes. To act as a sort of ammunition counter for your sub-weapon and to afford the player bonus points upon defeating a boss and picking up a magic crystal, which is a red round glowing orb that only drops after you defeat a boss. Aside from score, points are useful in that collecting 30,000 affords the player an extra life. And from there, every 50,000 points, you'll get another one. And whenever you do, a cute little jingle plays. The final stage of each block concludes with a boss fight. And these are some of my favorite moments in the game. There are six different bosses in the game and each boss is wholly unique. The art and music are both fantastic in this game. They're very detailed, appropriately themed, and well-crafted. The game does a lot to remind you that you're playing in a consistent place that is connected to itself. It even shows you different stages to come in the background and this may be the oldest game I've played that does something like this. Additionally, in between every block, you're given somewhat of a status update screen that is similar to what we saw in Ghosts and Goblins detailing the different stages, and it shows Simon walking and then approaching his next destination. And the music slaps every single track is a banger. The intro track sets the mood. Vampire Killer is classic. Stalker, Wicked Child, Walking Edge, Heart of Fire, Out of Time, and the level complete jingle. The whole thing is just... It kicks ass. And the sprites are nice and chonky. And the physics do a really good job of making Simon feel like a unit. It's just such a good balance of feeling powerful and vulnerable through different sections. And it's impressive what Castlevania manages to pull off despite being a very short game, even by NES standards. How Long to Beat suggests it takes around three hours to complete Castlevania. What it doesn't tell you is that half of that time is going to be spent fighting Dracula or trying 
trying to make it to death in One Piece, or trying to make it past Frankenstein and Igor. Basically, what it doesn't tell you is that if you know what you're doing, it takes less than an hour to beat this game, even with plenty of mistakes. Speedrunners can beat this game in under 12 minutes, and that's without any glitches or skipping anything. That's considerably less than the running time of this video. The bulk of the playtime in Castlevania comes from the challenge that it offers, but unlike games like Ghosts and Goblins and Adventure Island, Castlevania is balanced. Fair checkpoints, tough but not impossible challenges, and just about the perfect runtime considering. Castlevania is like that song that's short, but you play it on repeat. Personally, I played both the Famicom Disk System and NES versions of this game, and there aren't really any major differences. The only real difference is that you can save your game when you run out of lives in the Famicom Disk System version. And with that comes a name entry screen and an exclusive track that plays on the name entry screen. And that also naturally introduces load times to the Famicom Disk System version, but they're really not that bad. NES Castlevania owners really got shortchanged in the manual department. The NES manual is mostly black and white and it's pretty bare bones, but the Famicom Disk System manual is 40 pages of rich, colorful illustrations, explanations, and story information. Essentially, every hundred years, Dracula returns to the land of Transylvania to plague the land and bring forth the forces of hell. In this game, Dracula returns to his ancestral home, calling forth his loyal followers in an attempt to purge the world of human flesh. The responsibility of annihilating Dracula typically falls on someone from the Belmont clan's family line. And that's where you begin the game. You're Simon Belmont, grandson of Soleiu Belmont. <laughs> <laughs> Slay you. <laughs> gotta be kidding me. You assume responsibility, take your whip, known as either the Vampire Killer or Morning Star, and storm the castle. It's honestly pretty fleshed out when compared to contemporaries and the story department. The pickups and items in Castlevania can be classified into four distinct groups. Standard items, weapons, special items, and finally, hidden items. The standard items consist of hearts, money bags, and upgrades to your whip. The Morning Star can be upgraded two separate times, once from leather to chain, and once from chain to a longer chain. The chain variety of the whip is what features the Morning Star on the end, which is a spiked metal ball. Any variety of the chain whip does 1.5 times the damage of the leather whip. Your whip upgrades go away if you die, but whip upgrades tend to be the first things to drop from enemies and candles. And I can't believe that I haven't mentioned this yet, but yeah, um, there are are candles everywhere in this game, little candle posts, and when you whip them, items fall out. It's something that apparently became standard later in the franchise, but this is the first and only Castlevania game that I've played. But items can also be found by defeating enemies, by breaking blocks, and by standing in certain places for predetermined amounts of time. Anyway, there are three different kinds of money bags that you can pick up, and there are two different kinds of heart pickups, the small hearts and the big hearts. And the big hearts are worth five small hearts. And and as stated before, these act as an ammo counter for your sub weapon. And that brings me to the second type of item class, the sub weapons. There are five different types of sub weapons with varying degrees of usability. The dagger is the first sub weapon and also the most underwhelming. It's somewhat reminiscent of the knife from Ghosts and Goblins, but unlike Ghosts and Goblins, when you pick up a weapon in Castlevania, it is only ever an option to use it. You always have the Morning Star as your primary weapon, and the sub weapons only serve to further assist you and add variety to the way you can approach different challenges. To use the sub weapons, all you have to do is hold up on the d-pad and press B. The next sub weapon is the axe, and I found this generally more fun to use than the dagger in every respect. It's especially helpful against the first boss and it does more damage. Once you learn how to use its arc effectively, it's very satisfying, much more so than the axe in Ghosts and Goblins. The holy water is the undisputed goat of sub weapons, as it has a sort of paralyzing effect on bosses and enemies. So if you manage to time it right, you can trivialize certain
certain boss fights. In others, however, the fight is still very difficult. It has a very useful lingering effect where the fire will burn wherever it lands for a while. And usually if you have this, it's best to hold on to it rather than pick up another weapon. The cross, on the other hand, is the most fun item to use for me. It's as powerful as the ax and it also acts like a boomerang. If you throw it well, you'll often hit enemies more than once and it's effective against many bosses as well. The last sub weapon is the least useful in most scenarios, but it's an absolute godsend in the final block of the game. Unlike other weapons, it actually costs five hearts to use and it freezes all the enemies on screen for five seconds. It's pretty useless against bosses though. The third class of items is called special items and it consists of consumable items that have various effects on Simon. The Rosary Cross instantly destroys all regular enemies on screen and it produces a really cool visual and sound effect upon picking it up. The Invincibility Potion turns Simon invincible for five seconds and it's essentially useless. It simply does not last long enough to get any real use from it and you'll still die if you fall into one of the many pits in this game. So it's cool when you get it but it doesn't really ever matter or affect anything. The Pork Chop is one of the most useful items in this game and that it is the only way to restore Simon's health bar without defeating a boss. Simon has 16 bars of health and hits from enemies deal between two and four bars of damage. The pork chop restores six units of health, so it's quite a hefty chunk. This item is only found in secret blocks though. You really have to search for these, and when you're up against a wall in more ways than one, you will definitely be searching. The next two items are the double shot and the triple shot. These essentially act as upgrades to your sub weapons. Normally, you can only have one sub weapon sprite on screen at a time, and these items will allow you to throw more sub weapons at once. The stopwatch is unaffected by this, but as a concession, if you do find one of these, while you have the stopwatch, you get 700 bonus points. The last special item is the magic crystal, which only drops after defeating a boss. They indicate that the block has been completed, they trigger the level complete jingle, and they convert your hearts into bonus points, which sometimes results in an extra or bonus life. And the final classification of items are hidden items, which consist of flashing money bags that grant a thousand points, crowns and treasure chests, which grant 2000 points, one ups, which I sadly did not get a single one of these in my playthroughs. And lastly, a Moai head, which is worth 4000 points. And I believe that these can only be found in the second, slightly more challenging playthrough of this game. If you beat it once, you can play through a slightly harder version the second time. And that's where I found the Maui head or the Moai head, however you say it. Not including bosses, there are 15 different types of enemies in this game. And those dudes in Castlevania are pretty intense. There's not a whole lot to them individually, but there's a whole lot more variety than the only other Konami title I've played so far for this series, which was Goemon. Most enemies are unique in terms of how they move and how they operate. And typically each block has some enemies that you'll see more than in any other block. The enemies are as follows. Ghouls. These infinitely come at you, but they're very basic. These are kind of just there to teach you that when you use your whip you can damage enemies. Bats. These have a mild sine wave pattern but it's much more manageable than the other sine wave enemy in this game, the Medusa head. Panthers. These are really fast but not too threatening. They can surprise you a little bit at first but once you get the timing right it's rare they will damage you. Ravens. These have very cool and unique movements. They kind of track you, hover around you a little bit, and then dash at you. It's a problem sometimes when they get under you though. Eagles. These are essentially a hundred back delivery service. Fishmen. Somewhat annoying, but they're basically just ghouls that pop out of the water. But they can fire a projectile at you if you wait long enough. Medusa heads. These are the most famously annoying enemies in Castlevania, but they're really not that bad. There are worse sine wave pattern enemies. The real issue with the Medusa heads is when they're placed by big gaps and they knock you into them. Skeletons. These are annoying sometimes, but they're cool and very spooky. I like that they throw bones and I like that sometimes when you hit those bones you can get items out of them. Ghosts. These are one of my favorites. They have a really creepy design and they're maybe the most rare enemy in the game other than the bone dragons because they just kind of sneak up on you. You're never expecting them. Red skeletons. I hate that they come back to life. They're just ugh. I think that people tend to find themselves annoyed with the Medusa heads but for some reason the red skeletons are the most annoying enemies in the game to me. Spear knights. These really add to the castle vibe and it feels like 
an elite in Halo. Kind of like your rival class in this game. Axe Knights. Like hunters in Halo. Beefy as hell. The Axe Knights are really fun because they have like different modes of attacking you and they throw the axes both high and low and they take so many hits. And it's cool because they've got these big shields and if you throw like a holy water over the shield or if you get an axe behind the shield, you can completely ignore most of their protection. Flea men or hunchbacks. These are very tricky at first to deal with, but once you kind of realize how they work, it's really not that bad. For me, I would just kind of like show myself to them on screen and then I'd pull back real quick and then whip them. Whoosh. Bone towers. These are a cool enemy because they flash before they fire two fireballs. If you're not paying attention to the flash, you're probably going to get hit. So it's something that you have to be patient with and watch. They take six hits to destroy and there are some that are placed kind of annoyingly by gaps, but overall I think it's a really cool enemy. Bone dragons. These are awesome and really intimidating. And they also drop a whole bunch of hearts or a whole bunch of money bags upon defeating them. And lastly, the ultimate enemy in Castlevania are the gaps. Most of your deaths will probably be either to the bosses or to falling in these pits. A lot of people like to poke fun at the gaps and stuff, but honestly, it's really not that bad. There are only a few segments in the game where you're going to find yourself dying to gaps, and I will go over those later. Block one consists of stages one through three. Stage one starts in a sort of tutorial area outside the castle. I like this because the intro screen to the game shows you arriving and walking through the gates and this is exactly where the game begins. You pick up a few hearts and you make your way into the castle with a morning star and a dagger. The first segment inside the castle is still kind of teaching you things as you go along. Ghouls and panthers are the main enemies here. There are more candles and it gives you a little time to figure out how to use the stairs. And stairs Stairs are a little awkward in this game. At the end of the stage, it shows you the capabilities of the Rosary Cross before taking you to stage two. Stage two has some cleverly placed bats to try and cue you into the fact that there is meat hidden in the walls sometimes. The stairs cause me to take damage here a few times when backing up though. You take the stairs down and it leads to a brief underground path where the game teaches you about how fishmen operate and also has a platform to encourage a little exploration and brick breaking that ultimately rewards you with a flashing money bag and then it's on to stage three to fight the phantom bat. The axe is available right before this fight and highly recommended as it allows you to hit it when it's high in the air. Block two consists of stages four through six. This is really where the game begins to present you with some real challenges, even for people with 8-bit experience. There's a secret crown right at the beginning of stage four. This is your first introduction to the spear knights and the cross as well. It feels very castle-like and the darker color palette gives off the vibe of being deeper within the castle. Stage 5 is where it gets hard being your first intro to the Medusa heads and your first serious platforming challenge. If the heads hit you on the second portion, it sends you flying back. And there is also a secret treasure chest in the area below this. The first time that I ever tried this game, I believe that this is where I stopped, since I was only dipping my toe in. Stage 6 has some crushers with somewhat dubious hitboxes, but so long as you have patience, it's not that tough. It also provides you with holy water, which lets you absolutely cheese medusa the boss room itself is awesome though the purple windows really sell it for me block three consists of stages seven through nine stage seven is where wicked child starts playing and that track is just so sick it introduces you to hunchbacks skeletons ravens and ghosts as well as some platforming challenges where the ravens have a good shot at knocking you down to your doom i love the atmosphere and the aesthetic of block three it may be my favorite in the game. Maybe block four, but I like the ruins in both. Anyway, stage eight has a long path with Medusa heads and skeletons. And then after going up the first staircase, there's a spot that I always like to sit and chill at because with the castle tower in the background, it just really reminds me of where you meet Solaire in Dark Souls. It's a cozy spot. This stage wraps up with a brief platforming segment and a door to stage nine. Stage nine has some ravens perched atop statues and can be tricky to deal with as there are some gaps you'll likely fall down your first few tries due to the skeletons and the bone cannons. It also shows you block six in the distance. And it's so cool that it does that because it's just that reminder that you are in a specific place and that you have a destination.
combination. It concludes with the mummy fight, which is a lot easier if you pick up the pork chop. The dacker is available right before as well, but personally I found the whip from one side of both of them to be an effective and satisfying strat. The dagger can be useful for finishing them off though. Block four consists of stages 10 through 12. And personally, this caused me some of the most trouble in the game. Blocks four through six are a different tier of difficulty from blocks one through three. You start stage 10 in a catacomb sort of underground segment with a lot of bats and fishmen. I highly recommend picking up the holy water here as well, but you have to be careful. This also has just about the only moment in the game where I would consider it to be unfair though. Your first time through, there's just no way to know that these stalactites are part of the foreground and that you need to crouch. The window of realizing it is too small, so unless you're already aware, it will likely kill you and you'll lose a life here. Now, stage 11 is hard, but bravo to the developers because this is such a cool idea. It's like a mad dash to the boss room. Eagles are dropping hunchbacks on you and you're just hoping there aren't too many from behind. And then the bone dragon guards the entrance to stage 12. Stage 12 has two bone dragons you have to defeat before challenging the Frankenstein's monster and Igor. And honestly, this is the boss that took me the most tries aside from Dracula himself. Getting to this boss with full health and the holy water, which is supposed to help, is very difficult even with the pork chop hidden in the wall right before. I ended up defeating this boss a variety of different ways over the course of my playthroughs, but it was difficult each time except the very last time somehow I managed to beat him on the first try with one bar of health. And I actually did that when I was recording the uh, TV shots for this video. It's one of the coolest arenas for a fight and it's a good challenging boss. It's just one that I struggled with a lot. Block 5 consists of stages 13 through 15. And this is what some people consider to be the most difficult section of this game. And I can't blame them, but I think that the final section is harder. Stage 13 is long and challenging. Lots of skeletons and red skeletons and hunchbacks and pressure. Because this is where the holy water is located and you'll want to hold on to that all the way up to the boss room if possible. Stage 14 is a challenging mixture of axe knights and red skeletons and is honestly one of the hardest sections for me. It's one of those sections that you should should be able to get through without taking damage if patient, but where it's also very easy to make a mistake. Stage 15 is just about the hardest in the game only because unlike Dracula, there isn't a checkpoint immediately before. The first bone cannon is nerve wracking, especially if you still have the holy water that you want to hold on to. But if you make it to the second story here, thankfully there is some meat waiting right before the hallway leading to death. There are indefinite Medusa heads and ax knights here, but holy water or the cross make this much easier to deal with. And then there's death. If you have holy water, GG, easy, no re. But if you don't... <laughs> <laughs> in all seriousness though, if you don't, focus more on avoiding the sides than hitting him. It's really hard though, since the entirety of this stage is probably the longest in the game. Continuing here is just rough, because there's a lot to overcome just to get back to stage 15. Block 6 is the final block in the game, and it consists of stages 16 through 18. Sorry. 16 through 18, thinking in reverse. It is extremely challenging, and it is just about guaranteed to make first timers, second timers, or 10th timers spend to continue, or two, or 10. Stage 16 has a bridge full of gaps and phantom bats. It also has a stopwatch that you need to pick up if you want an easier time with stage 17. Stage 17 is hard, real hard. Skeletons, eagles, hunchbacks inside, gaps, stairs, and one set path that you have to go through. The hunchbacks can hop to wherever you are. Through walls, through platforms, it doesn't matter. There's a hidden pork chop here, but it can be risking to go for depending on where the eagles are. It's a lot easier easier to pick this up if you have the stopwatch. I died here a lot and the first time that I made it through was a time where I held on to the stopwatch. And then comes the final stage, stage 18, Dracula. And here is where the developers probably made the best decision that they made in this entire game so far. And that was that unlike the other blocks in this game, if you spend a continue on stage 18, you do not start back from the beginning of the block. You start right back in front of Dracula. Wow. Bravo. 
round of applause because this game would be so much worse if it weren't for this decision. Because Dracula is so hard that the only way to really get past him is by throwing yourself at him. Throwing yourself at the wall, trying again and again, and eventually memorizing his pattern for his first phase and struggling through his pattern for his second phase. He has two forms and he takes 16 precise hits to the head on his first form and 16 more in his second. He casts fireballs and can spawn on top of you. He does four bars of damage per hit. So essentially you are afforded four mistakes between 32 precise hits and two unique attacking patterns. But honestly, what a fight. It feels impossible at first. It's, it makes it feel like there's no way you could beat it, at least for me. And it's one of those boss fights where like when you finally do overcome the challenge, it's an unbeatable feeling. The Dracula fight really sealed the deal on this game for me. The atmosphere, walking up to him, the just divine struggle of fighting him. At first, I was complaining, thinking that like, this is dumb, they made him way too hard, this is stupid. But then like, once you find the timing for like jumping over the fireballs, there are plenty of strategies in this game to beat Dracula. Some involve getting four hits at once somehow with the cross. I I tried to do that kind of stuff, but what worked best for me was just one hit at a time and focusing on where he was. And also I was told that it's best to continue moving, but I actually had kind of bad luck with that. And what I would do is I would stand still for a little while after hitting him and then move once I felt he was about to appear. And it's funny because this game does something to you psychologically, where when you're in the fight, you start to get this sort of sixth sense for where he's about to appear. Finally making it through the first time though, it's like, suddenly phase one Dracula is just like a breeze and actually fun. It's like the most fun part of the game even. When I first beat the Famicom Disk System version and I came back to it, I realized that I hadn't saved and so I got to beat him again and that made me excited. So I guess I should move on to my final thoughts because I've been talking for a while. Something interesting happened when I was playing this game again to record the TV segment of this game, which I always like to include the little white Sony Trinitron. And what it was is I was recording and then I had this idea to actually physically move the camera up very close to the screen and see if I could get it to still not have the banding. It's a little hard to record these older TVs. And so once I did, I just started playing and I don't know, I was crushing it. Like, uh, I just like, I beat Frankenstein on the first try and then I got the holy water and I held on to it all the way to the end to death and beat death on my first try. And I thought I was about to beat the game again, but I was, you know, running low on batteries and time and it was late. And so I didn't actually beat it that specific time, but it's just like, this game has a way of hooking you in and making you want to beat it. And it's also just kind of like a great introduction, I think, to 8-bit gaming for people who have never 8-bit gamed. It's just a tight, concise package. The gameplay is consistent and fair and challenging, and it's not too long. I think that anyone who beats this game, if you sit down and you beat it, there's no way you can't at least have some sort of interest in trying out other 8-bit games. I think it's a good starting 8-bit game that's not Mario 3. It's just fun to pick up and play this game. And like when you pick it up, you play it and then like you keep playing it, you see some success and it becomes kind of addicting. And it's just, uh, it's not very long, but it's so good at what it does. It's good in a different way from Zelda and Metroid. Those games are like mind bendingly unique and transformative. And Castlevania is just so good at that one thing. It's not trying to reinvent the wheel really, but it's just absolutely crushing the action platformer feel. And it takes everything that Ghosts and Goblins was kind of trying to do on the NES and just, I don't know. It's really not the same as Ghosts and Goblins. To be fair, those are two different styles of games while they both have similar theming and are both action platformers. They're, they're really different, but Castlevania just like, I mean, it's like, it's almost like what you wanted Ghosts and Goblins to be. But at the same time, not really. I don't know. I don't really, maybe I should just stop with the Ghosts and Goblins comparison.
comparisons. Another thing is that there is a more challenging second run and I, I beat this game around four times, like four and a half or three and a half, something like that um, over the course of my playthroughs. I played it a lot and I did make it, I think to Medusa in the second playthrough, or at least that's where I stopped because it just kind of takes the things that are annoying to deal with and multiplies those and enemies don't take more hits. The bosses are exactly the same. And so the second playthrough doesn't didn't really feel worth it to me. I was having less fun and I actually just restarted and played the original version again. It's just a fantastic little game. Highly recommend to anyone, whether they're into retro gaming or not. It's it's that kind of thing. Like you don't have to be into it or looking for that specific experience. I, I it's just yeah. <laughs> It's a great game and I had a really excellent time with it. I'm excited to play more Konami games because they're really crushing it. But um, yeah, thanks for watching the channel. Thanks to everyone who continues to comment and uh, thanks for watching. Peace.